Bacteria and viruses aren't the only things that can cause infections in human beings. Lots of eukaryotic pathogens exist too. These are things like amoebas and fungi and helminths that can get inside our body and cause infection. Today that's what we're going to be talking about, so stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Not everything that parasitizes us is a virus or a bacterium. There are lots of different eukaryotic pathogens out there that can cause disease and potentially fatal illnesses in human beings. Now, one of the things I've noticed since being in the world of microbiology is how we typically refer to the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic pathogens. Typically, we refer to viruses and bacteria as pathogens. On the other hand, we often refer to eukaryotic pathogens as parasites. It's really a distinction without a difference. The bottom line is, whatever it is, whether it's a bacterium or a virus or a worm, for example, these are things that parasitize our body. So what we're gonna talk about today are eukaryotic pathogens. We'll talk about fungi, protozoa, helminths, which is a fancy word for worms, and arthropods. So let's start with the protozoa. So protozoa are typically single-celled eukaryotic organisms. They belong to the group Pro, the, the, the kingdom protista. So protista is unofficially broken down into either the protozoans, which are the animal-like protists, and the algae, which are the plant-like protists. And there are also some mixotrophs, so they're like euglena, that can do both. But the protozoa are the ones that are mainly going to harm us. And despite the fact that they are single-celled eukaryotes, the thing that we have to recognize is they can be incredibly destructive. In fact, protozoa are responsible for some of the most fatal diseases on the planet Earth. So just a reminder that all of these organisms that we're talking about are eukaryotic. So they're going to have cell structures similar to us. They're going to have all of the intracellular organelles. And quite often, it's either going to be the shape of the cell or what organelles that organism possesses that help us to categorize which type of eukaryote that we're talking about. The first group of eukaryotes that we'll talk about are the amoebas. So if you remember what an amoeba is, it's one of those organisms, it's single celled and it has no defined shape. So they move through the action of pseudopods, they basically extend part of their cytoplasm and then drag the rest of the body to catch up with it. Uh, the three most common amoebas that, we'll, that we talk about uh, in a microbiology class like this uh, are going to be uh, Negluria phalari, Acanth amoeba, and Entamoeba histolytica. So let's stop, start with Entamoeba histolytica. Antamoeba histolytica has a uh, pretty bad sounding name. It's known as the man-eating amoeba. Uh, and it is acquired by ingesting water that's been contaminated with the cysts, which is sort of a protective structure that amoebas can form when they're in a non-favorable environment. These cysts typically got there because someone defecated in the water and now you've ingested it. Uh, these amoebas will move into your intestine where they will colonize it um, and they will begin sort of living off of you in that fashion. One of the enzymes that that um, entamoeba can actually produce is called mucinase. And mucinase is an enzyme that uh, digests mucin, which is a component of the mucus line that makes up your intestine. So what ends up happening is, is while it's in your gut, it's irritating your gut, it's digesting the mucus, it's causing massive amounts of diarrhea, which in and alone can kill you. Um, but if it succeeds in digesting all of the mucus lining of your intestine, of your small intestine, it can actually breach through and then start infecting other organisms. So it's not uncommon for people that have contracted entamoeba histolytica to have uh, lesions on, uh, on their, their liver or their heart or their lungs, all of which could be potentially fatal. Negluria phalari is not much better. Negluria phalari is known as the brain-eating amoeba. Uh, Negluria phalari is found in bodies of fresh water uh, throughout the world. Um, and in most cases, when people ingest it, it just your body just breaks it down and, and it's gone. It's not a problem. But in extremely rare cases, Negluria phalari actually makes it uh, into the brain. It usually gets there by kind of punching through the sinuses. And once it's in your brain, there's you only have about two to three weeks left to live because it's slowly going to digest the cells in your brain until it kills you. Um, unfortunately, this disease is almost always fatal and medical interventions rarely work. Uh, the third amoeba, um, acanth amoeba, is also found in fresh water. In fact, it's commonly found even in municipal water supplies. The way acanth amoeba typically infects you is through contact lenses. So if you wash your contact lenses in tap water, which you're not supposed to do, you're supposed to always use um, the contact fluid that you get. 
um, it ends up finding itself pressed between the contact lens and your eyeball and it migrates into your eye and then eventually it'll get behind your eye and cause something called amoebic keratitis. It basically begins digesting the backside of your eye um, in where the optic nerve and, and, and that part of your, and, and your retina and that type of area is. Um, this is extremely painful. Uh, you'll note a loss of visual acuity. Um, the end result, if left untreated, could actually be permanent blindness. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, occasionally uh, acanthamoeba just keeps going and it goes right through into the brain and can cause a uh, severe form of meningoencephalitis. That's exactly what nuclear thalari causes and the fate is likely similar uh, once the amoeba gets into your brain. So amoeba's not so good. The next group we'll talk about is the apicomplexans. So the apicomplexans are a group of single-celled pro protozoa um, that possess something called an apicoplast, which is a cell structure that has been found to be used for these cells to invade other host cells. Um, these include some very, very uh, important pathogens, uh, most notably uh, plasmodium. The genus plasmodium is within this group. Um, this includes plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium malariae. These are the uh, eukaryotic pathogens that lead to the various forms of uh, malaria that are found on the planet Earth. Uh, malaria is one of the most deadly pathogens or most deadly diseases on Earth, killing hundreds of thousands of people a year um, in mainly tropical regions of the globe. Apicomplexans also includes uh, Toxoplasma gondii. So Toxoplasma gondii causes a significantly less severe infection than uh, Plasmodium does. Uh, so Toxoplasmosis is largely going to be um, asymptomatic in healthy individuals. However, uh, if you are immunocompromised, it can cause a pretty severe infection. Um, special risk category goes to uh, pregnant women. So um, pregnant women are typically directed to no longer change their cat's litter, particularly if their cat is an outdoor cat. The main reason why is they can acquire Toxoplasma gondii, and Toxoplasma actually has the ability to breach through um, the placenta and, and affect the fetus, and the effect in the, the consequences of that could be pretty pronounced, uh, ranging from uh, uh, deformities uh, in the baby as well as stillbirth and, and premature, uh, premature birth uh, in some cases. So it's typically why uh, women want, pregnant women want to avoid changing litter boxes because they could acquire this particular parasite um, through that activity. Another epicomplexin is Babesia microti. So Babesia microti it causes a bloodstream infection called Babesiosis. This is spread by the same ticks that spread uh, Lyme disease. So in fact, the, the co-infection rate of Babesiosis and, and Lyme disease from the same tick is typically around 10% in some regions uh, of, the, of the world where Lyme disease is prevalent. Um, some cases of Babesiosis go completely unnoticed. They're asymptomatic. Uh, and people who, the, who do develop symptoms, uh, the symptoms tend to sort of mimic malaria, but these are typically gonna be people that are not in the a part of the world where malaria is actually a problem. So while it looks similar, it's not, it's caused by a different pathogen, but it's caused by the fact that Babesia microti does live within the blood cells just like Plasmodium does. The last three that we'll talk about are Cryptosporidium hominis, Cryptosporidium parvum, and Cyclospora chiatinensis. These three uh, uh, cause uh, some, some acute forms of diarrhea. Um, cryptosporidium uh, is going to be acquired largely through water. Um, so you ingest water that contains the cysts, and then those will get into the intestine, uh, irritate the intestine, and cause diarrhea. Uh, very similar to what we saw with amoebic dysentery, but uh, significantly less severe. Um, the exception being if somebody is immunocompromised. Um, most healthy individuals will be able to rid their body of it, whereas people who are immunocompromised, for example, someone that has AIDS uh, or another severe immunocompromising condition, this can actually be a fatal form, uh, a, a, f a fatal parasitic infection. Cyclospora chiatinensis is also less likely to kill you, but the disease is a little more pronounced in people who are even healthy. Uh, this is typically acquired through uh, getting, uh, ingesting unwashed or eating unwashed produce that's been contaminated with human feces. So um, different sources there, but very similar effect, which is why I lump those guys together. So the next group we'll talk about are the trypanosomes. So the trypanosomes are actually descendants of the euglenids. Uh, you may have seen euglena uh, in a previous science class uh, where you see these, they're green and they're single-celled and they move around pretty fast uh, when they're in water. They're actually really interesting. They're called mixotropes because they can either make their own food from sunlight via photosynthesis because they have chloroplasts, or they can ingest their food. Uh, they have a choice depending on the conditions. So trypanosomes are euglenids who've lost their chloroplasts. And as, as a result, uh, they are now parasites uh, because they have to get their food by ingesting it and not from making it from the sun. 
One genus of trypanosomes that can cause infections in humans are the Leishmania, uh, Leishmania donovani, Leishmania tropica, and Leishmania brasilensis cause a disease called Leishmaniasis. So Leishmaniasis actually comes in three different forms, cutaneous, mucocutaneous, and visceral uh, with varying degrees of severity. So uh, cutaneous Leishmania um, causes skin ulcers. Um, these skin ulcers can be quite severe and they typically end up scarring once they've resolved, but they can actually spread all over the body in some cases, and this can actually potentially be fatal because of the sheer amount of skin that's actually involved. Um, mucocutaneous leishmania, leishmania is, uh, leishmaniasis is actually um, a little more severe. It's not only going to affect the skin, but it can also affect the mouth and the nose, and people can actually like lose portions of those from, this, from the ulcers that form. But the most severe form of leishmaniasis is the visceral form, and the visceral form affects the internal organs. Uh, so this is typically going to result in something called hepatosplenomegaly. And the infection affects mainly organs like the spleen and the liver, and they actually swell up and become palpable. You can actually feel them and see them. Um, and the end result is, is typically fatal uh, if it's left untreated. Another trypanosome that can cause an infection in humans is uh, trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, so trypanosoma cruzi causes a disease called Chagas disease, and this is found mainly in South and Central America, as well as portions of North America. It's spread by a bug called the assassin bug uh, that um, spreads that particular trypanosome to you. Uh, Chagas disease can, when you initially get it, um, you get bit by the assassin bug and the, the bite wound can be itchy and you might get headaches, but then it kind of resolves. The bigger issue is, is if it stays in your body between 10 and 30 years down the road, you can get some major gastrointestinal problems. You can get esophageal swelling, but the big one is it seems to have a way of damaging the heart. And when it damages the heart, it can cause um, chronic heart disease um, and damage the heart to the point where you can end up in uh, heart failure and cardiac failure, which is um, almost always going to be fatal uh, if it's left untreated. Trypanosoma brucei actually exists in the old world. So Trypanosoma brucei is acquired through the bite of the tsetse fly, which exists in Africa. And this causes a disease, causes a disease called African sleeping sickness or sleeping sickness. Early on in the disease, the symptoms are somewhat mild, but later on in its progression, uh, people that have this are going to have confusion, but the big hallmark symptom is the fact that they're gonna have sleep inversion. So this begins to affect their nervous system uh, and it makes it so that they sleep during the day and they're awake at night or they have trouble sleeping at all. Um, this is almost always fatal once it progresses to this stage. If it is treated and resolves, um, any of the neurologic damage that's been caused is likely to be permanent at this point. Uh, but African sleeping sickness is almost always fatal if left untreated. The last group of protozoa that we're talking about are the metamonads. So metamonads are also quite interesting and they've also undergone some form of de-evolution. Um, they are one of the few groups of eukaryotic cells that lack mitochondria. They've basically lost them through degenerative evolution, which is called de-evolution. And as a result, they exist solely on anaerobic metabolism. Uh, there are two different species that we'll talk about here. Um, one of them is Giardia lamblia. The disease it causes is called giardiasis. Um, you typically acquire this by either ingesting water um, from, fresh body, from, from fresh bodies of water like streams or rivers or lakes um, that other mammals use. So typically if some of their feces that's been contaminated gets in the water and you drink it, you can acquire the cyst uh, and then it will germinate in your intestine and it causes um, a form of chronic diarrhea. The other way you get it is through the fecal oral route. Um, it turns out that giardiasis spreads like wildfire in places like daycares uh, because kids are gross. And I don't mean that in a harmful way. My kids are gross too. Uh, young kids do not have particularly good hygiene. So uh, it spreads because they don't they, they touch parts of their body or they don't wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. Then they touch toys and then so on and so forth. And it's just this big uh, cycle of people infecting and reinfecting themselves with Giardia lamblia. It's fairly easily treatable uh, once it's been detected. The other one is Trichomonas vaginalis. So Trichomonas vaginalis causes trichomoniasis, also known as trich, which is a sexually transmitted infection. Um, in almost all men who have it, it's completely asymptomatic. And in about 50% of women who have it, it's asymptomatic. Um, the symptoms are generally mild, but um, if they are noticed or they are detected, um, it should be treated because there can be complications uh, with respect to pregnancy in women who do have uh, trichomoniasis. The next group of eukaryotes we'll talk about are the fungi. So fungi take on many different shapes and forms, and you're probably most familiar with the friendly fungi, things like mushrooms and things like that, but there are a large number of fungi that can actually be harmful. 
And what's interesting is most of the fungi that are harmful to humans exhibit something called dimorphism. So dimorphism is the ability of certain fungi and other species to take on multiple forms. So when you encounter many of the pathogenic fungi in the environment, they're going to grow as a mycelium or a mold, and they'll may be made out of these long hair-like cells called hyphae. However, when we find them inside of the human body, they typically exist as a yeast, which is a small unicellular form that doesn't grow like a mold. Now, not all pathogenic fungi are dimorphic, but a large number of them are. So the first species of fungus we'll talk about is actually not dimorphic, and this is Aspergillus. In particular, we're going to talk about Aspergillus fumigatus, which is one of the most common pathogenic black molds that we find uh, um, it, with respect to humans. So Aspergillus fumigatus is actually problematic for a couple reasons. One, it has the ability to be inhaled by, uh, by people who are around it, and this can lead to an infection in the lungs. It also produces something called aflatoxin, which is not only toxic, but also potentially cancerous. Now, when we find Aspergillus in the environment, it is going to grow in a black uh, filamentous mold, in a mycelium. When you contract it, it's going to grow the same way inside of your lungs. And one of the things that can happen is you actually get these things called mold balls or fungal balls that grow in, in tissues like the lungs. And this can be problematic because they can actually block breathing pathogens, passages or in some cases, Aspergillus is actually able to disseminate, which means leave the original site of the infection and move to other parts of the body as the mold spreads. You can see how this is quite problematic for people who end up being exposed to black mold, which is one of the reasons why black mold remediation is so important um, to maintain your living conditions, to maintain healthy living conditions because of the potential problems that Aspergillus can cause. Now, the remainder of the fungi that we'll talk about in this particular video are going to be dimorphic. When we find them in the wild, they are going to actually exist as, uh, as filamentous molds. But inside of the human body, they're almost always going to look like small round cysts. They're going to look like small yeast cells uh, when they're in a human being. And it turns out that this dimorphism is largely temperature dependent. At cooler environmental temperatures, they tend to exist as molds. At warmer temperatures, they exist as yeasts. So this first group of dimorphic fungi that we'll talk about, we're actually going to talk about together. These are going to be Histoplasma capsulatum, Blastomyces dermatitidis, Coccidioides imitis, and Coccidioides posidacei. Now what's interesting is, as with most fungi, the way these are contracted by the individual is by inhaling them into the lungs. The other possible route of infection is typically on the skin. Now, if we're talking about Histoplasma capsulatum, Histoplasma capsulatum is actually one of the most common fungi on the planet Earth. It's found on all terrestrial land masses with the exception of Antarctica. But when we talk about Blastomyces dermatitidis, we're actually talking about a much more restrictive environment. For the most part, Blastomyces dermatitidis is found east of the Mississippi River in the United States and Canada, as well as the Great Lakes region. Whereas Coccidioides species are almost exclusively located in South and Central America and the uh, drier, arid portions of, of the Western United States, like California, Nevada, and so on and so forth. All of these work basically the same way. In some individuals, when these species, when they inhale the spores that belong to this particular mold, those spores get into the lungs and they begin to grow. And they form these inclusions in the lungs and they can cause, uh, typically they, they, they announce themselves as a form of fungal pneumonia. Now, as with all fungi, they do have the possibility of disseminating. And when they do disseminate, they can actually cause brain infections or meningitis. Uh, if they're in, and those, of course, can potentially be fatal. Now, when it comes to uh, the types of infections, um, histoplasma capsulum or histoplasmosis isn't typically severe. It's really only severe in individuals that have a that have an immunocompromising condition. So it might be a problem for somebody that has HIV or somebody that's uh, undergoing cancer therapy uh, or something like that. But in most individuals, it's not a problem. On the other hand, uh, blastomyces and coccidioides infections, uh, so blastomycosis and coccidioidomycosis, try pronouncing that one, um, are very, very severe, and they can cause infections that can last for years um, and, and while, they're on, when, while they're under treatment. And if left untreated, both of these could potentially be fatal. Now, another type of fungus that can cause infections uh, is Candida albicans. It, it too is a dimorphic fungus. If you were to grow it on a petri dish in a lab, it would actually grow as a mold, but on your body, and this is typically where it lives, it lives either on your body or in your mucous membrane, such as your mouth, um, they can cause, uh, they, they, live, they exist as a yeast. 
and in fact the, the major type of infection caused by candida albicans is called a yeast infection it can also cause thrush in the oral cavity now candida albicans is present in or on about 99 percent of all human beings it's part of your normal microbiota and is normally harmless and the only way it does cause an infection is if you end up being immune compromised for some some for some reason so for example thrush is quite common in babies why well simply they don't have a very strong immune system uh their immune system hasn't come online yet and um you know so uh when the normal microbiota gets disturbed it can then lead to uh either a yeast infection or thrush um in in individuals so the last two groups of eukaryotes we're going to talk about are going to be within the animal kingdom so of course protozoa are in the protists which is its own kingdom fungi are their own kingdom of eukaryotes but now we're going to start talking about helminths and then we'll move on to arthropods both of these fall under the kingdom animalia in the world of eukaryotes so the other thing to note when we get to helminths and when we get to uh, arthropods is we're really kind of leaving the world of microbiology at this point most of these things we're talking about now are going to be multicellular um, and they're going to be macroscopic but again we're talking about things that are pathogenic to humans um, and as a result we typically we, we talk about these within the umbrella of microbiology and human disease microbiology which is kind of where i'm focusing these videos so first let's talk about what helminths are helminths are our funny word for worms and flukes so we break the world of helminths down into three different types of worm we've got your nematodes which are your round worms we have your cestodes which are your tapeworms and then we have your trematodes which are flukes and we'll go down and talk about some examples of each of these groups that are pathogenic to humans first let's start with nematodes the first one we'll talk about are known as pinworms. The technical name, the scientific name for them is Enterobius vermicularis. So Enterobius vermicularis is a um, is an, an animal that or is a is a worm that lives in the intestines. It can cause intestinal distress, but it also causes anal itching. Um, the it, it's very easily treated. It's fairly commonly found in kids. Uh, kids are gross. Uh, it's spread through the fecal oral route. So um, if if one child somehow contaminates their hands or something with with their feces that contains the eggs or the larvae that can spread to another kid fairly readily. Um, the way to test for this is also known as the tape test and quite simply uh, you uh, the female of the species will actually lay its eggs uh, just outside of the intestine uh, near the rectum and with a small piece of tape you can actually uh, locate those eggs and bring them to the doctor and they'll say yep your child has pinworms uh, and they can treat it very simply and very easily to rid themselves of the infection. I, Another group of, uh, of nematode are the hookworms. So hookworms are, are not so great. Um, there are two different kinds. Uh, there's the New World hookworm called uh, 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 Nicator americanus, and there is the Old World hookworm, which is Ancylostoma duodenale. Um, they both enter your body and have the same sort of life cycle. So the way they enter typically is, again, the fecal route they typically get excreted in people's waste but if you were to step on that waste with your bare feet uh the would use their hooks to burrow through your feet get into your bloodstream and then travel to your lungs and then from their from your lungs you would cough them back up and then swallow them uh and these are at the larval stage then once they reach the larvae reach your your intestine they will reach adulthood reproduce and then lay eggs and then they would secrete those eggs uh out in your stool and then the process repeats itself um, now, when it comes to hookworms, um, you might, if they're just in your intestine, you might notice some intestinal discomfort and, and things like that. But the problem is they have the ability to spread and they can move to other organs and throughout the body. And at that point, they can cause some pretty severe infections. Um, hookworm infection can be potentially fatal if there is a large number of them in your body. Uh, so if you do have hookworms or diagnosed with them, you should get them treated. One of the most common nematodes you find in humans is Ascaris lumbricoides. So Ascaris lumbricoides is a roundworm that's able to reproduce in very high numbers. Um, it is typically acquired uh, through the fecal oral route uh, when it is ingested and then it re reaches maturity inside the host's body. Um, the problem with, uh, with this is that it can reproduce in very high numbers and it can quite literally begin blocking body passages. Um, so it can, it can cause like bowel obstructions and things like that. The other thing is, is they can kind of migrate and disseminate throughout the body if they're able to get out of the intestine. Uh, again, they can be found in, ju in just very large numbers within people uh, who need to be dewormed um, if, if they are found to have them, or it could potentially kill you in a number of ways, uh, causing blockages or causing 
um, deficiency, nutritional deficiencies, and so on and so forth, because these guys are actually uh, sort of sharing your food as you ingest it if you are infected with them. The last one is an example of what is referred to as a filarial uh, roundworm. And this is Dracunculus metanensis, otherwise known as the guinea worm. Um, and guinea worm actually gets into, in a fairly odd way, uh, you uh, ingest, so it's, it lives inside of a, a small crustacean called cyclops. And if you ingest the water with contaminated cyclops, uh, it will then grow inside of your body uh, where it will eventually migrate into your into your like outside of your gut into your uh, body cavity uh, where they will mate and then eventually the impregnated female will begin to work her way to your epidermis and then she'll slowly over the period of a week or two burrow her way out of your skin through a very painful sore um, and then leave your body find water and lay more eggs to begin the life cycle um, this is actually a fairly easy to treat infection and the world health organization has put it on its list of like diseases they can completely eradicate with fairly minimal effort if they can just get some outreach and i think as of last update they had eradicated it in 187 countries are uh, now uh free of Dracunculus metanensis so uh, that's kind of cool uh, the world health organization does a lot of helpful things and that's just an example of one so let's move on to trematodes so trematodes are flukes um, what's interesting about flukes is they only have one body opening, so they have a mouth, but no anus, which means uh, they take their food and digest it and then regurgitate it. Um, flukes typically have very complex life cycles that usually involve one or two different intermediate hosts before reaching, in our case, uh, in this case, us. Um, the most prominent example of a trematode uh, for our context would be Clonorchis sinensis, which is a liver fluke. So essentially this gets into your body uh, uh, by through ingestion and then it makes its way to either like to your gallbladder or your bile duct and then begins living off of your bile the problem is is that as it's doing that it's removing bile from your body which you need but it's also damaging those organs uh, which which can be potentially fatal um, also exposure to clonicus sinensis has been found in some cases to increase your risk of developing hepatocarcinomas later in life then the last group of helmets we'll talk about are the cestodes. So cestodes are your tapeworms, and there are lots of different species of tapeworms. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, tapeworms involve some sort of complex life cycle that inver involves uh, s involves at least one host before reaching its final host. Um, and there are tapeworms, there are beef tapeworms, and pork tapeworms, and fish tapeworms. And the way we acquire them as human beings is typically through ingestion. So you ingest meat that contains uh, the worms and then they make it into your body. Uh, tapeworms almost always have a scolex, which is sort of like a, a, a hooking mechanism that allows them to attach on via a sucker to your intestine and begin sucking nutrition out of you. Um, they can grow to great lengths. Their bodies are always made out of segmented proglottids um, that can branch off. And the proglottids are very interesting is they can break off and become to give rise to the next generation. They are also functional hermaphrodites in the sense that they have both male and female genitalia and they sort of reproduce uh, in and of themselves. So uh, examples of tapeworms that you may encounter are uh, Tinea saginatum, which is the beef tapeworm, uh, Tinea solium, uh, which is the pork tapeworm, and Diphylobothrium latum, which is a fish tapeworm. And the way you acquire these uh, simply is by, uh, by ingesting undercooked meat that contain the tapeworm uh, and then they can begin to live in you. Signs and symptoms of having a tapeworm often aren't much. Um, you can have a tapeworm for a very long time and have no symptoms, but you may eventually end up developing either intestinal blockages or uh, vitamin deficiencies. And the main reason why is uh, tapeworms can leach a can grow to great sizes and can leach a fair amount of your nutrition away from you, uh, causing a host of problems. And finally, we'll, we'll move on to our second group of animals. Uh, we'll talk about the arthropods. Now, arthropods are interesting in the sense that in some cases, they themselves are the parasite. And in other cases, they are a vector, which means they are a delivery mechanism in which other pathogens make it into our body. So first, let's start with the ones that they themselves are actually parasites. So one of the most common ones is Sarcoptes scabii, which is the human itch mite. And this causes a disease called scabies. Uh, these get on your skin, they feed off of your blood, they reproduce, uh, typically reproducing, uh, laying eggs within one of your one of your hair follicles, the larvae then um, hatch in your hair follicles. This can cause uh, some inflammation and some itching. 
uh, the larvae then drop down and then move on to the next host to reproduce the cycle. Another example of an arthropod parasite is Pediculus humanus. Uh, so Pediculus humanus is the, is the, is the common louse uh, or a skin louse. Again, this, these are blood suckers uh, that get on your body. Uh, they, they use your blood uh, for food, but they can cause uh, vast amounts of itching um, and they can, they can be kind of gross. Um, these are very common and they're pretty much harmless for the most part, but uh, they can be psychologically damaging for the individuals who get them. Pulex irritans is another example of an arthropod parasite. These are fleas. Uh, so again, fleas get on your body. Uh, they cause itching because they're, they're biting you and they're trying to, um, and to ingest your blood because that is their particular food source. Um, they, can, again, can easily be spread from one person to the next or from you to your pet, for example, uh, which may be how you acquired them in the first place. Uh, so again, uh, they can be problematic, but in, with the, in this particular species is not the one known to show the bubonic plague. We'll talk about that one in just a minute. So the typical, typical fleas are not going to spread the disease. Um, there are specific species of fleas that do spread illness. And the last example of an arthropod parasite is Cymax lechularis, which is the bed bugs. So you may have heard the phrase, don't let the bed bugs bite. Well, it turns out the bed bugs are back. Um, they've become more prevalent over the past 15 to 20 years uh, because they've become resistant to the treatments that we typically use to rid ourselves of them. Uh, so bed bugs, again, uh, aren't really going to cause a major problem, but they can be disturbing. They can make it very hard to sleep. And again, they can be psychologically damaging because they're going to cause a vast amount of itching uh, and they can be problematic in that way. The other thing that arthropods can do is serve as a vector. So in addition to being a parasite to you, uh, in being a parasite, they can also bring other things to you that can potentially infect you and kill you. Perhaps the greatest killer of uh, the greatest animal killer of humans of all time are mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes are believed to be responsible for upwards of 700,000 deaths worldwide each year because they can spread infections that are so fatal. Diseases like malaria, for example, are spread by mosquitoes as an arthropod vector. Another great example of this is Ixodes scapularis, which is the common deer tick. Uh, Ixodes scapularis is able to spread Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, as well as Babesia microti, which is the protozoan that causes Babesiosis. But perhaps the most profound example of an arthropod vector is Xenocilla chiapis. Uh, Xenocilla is the species of flea that was responsible for transmitting the plague bacterium and is still responsible for transmitting plague bacterium. Um, this is the, so this is uh, Yersinia pestis, which is the gram negative rod, which is known to cause plague. Uh, so uh, put it together and what you see is that not only are arthropods themselves parasites of ours, but quite often in being parasites, because they do so by gaining access to our bloodstream, they can accidentally at times bring with them other pathogens. So it's important to understand, uh, despite the fact that they are fairly large and macroscopic and multicellular, how important arthropods actually are to human health and disease. So as you can see, there are lots of different eukaryotic pathogens that can harm us. You can have small things like protozoa that can actually infect our body and cause disease, or you can have larger things like arthropods that live off our blood, and in doing so can bring with them other pathogens that could potentially harm us. The one thing to note about eukaryotic infections is they're often very hard to fight off with, with antifungal or antiparasitic drugs. The main reason being is when we try to do uh, anti antimicrobial therapy, we try to find things about the pathogenic microbe that are different from our own cells. Unfortunately, this is incredibly challenging when it comes to eukaryotic pathogens because at the cellular level, they're simply not that different from us. I hope you guys learned a lot today. I really appreciate you tuning in and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.